What's up, everybody, and welcome back to In Search of Answers, the show where you guys ask me questions and I do my very best to answer them. I got a few questions picked out uh, that we're going to get into today. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question to potentially be answered here on the show, um, there's two ways you can do that. One is that you can just leave a comment here on YouTube. Uh, just ask your question in the comments on YouTube. I will do my best to get to it. Uh, the other is that if you are a, a patron, if you go to patreon.com slash devil or you can hold over there. If you're a, a patron subscriber, uh, there is an option that you'll find in the description for this video to be able to submit questions as a patron and patrons get a uh, first crack at having their questions answered. So let's get into it for today. First two questions do actually come from Patreon. First one comes from Dave who says straight up Starcraft three. Will we ever see it? If not, are RTS games like that just not what's worth making anymore? So as far as Starcraft three itself, um, I definitely have a lot of thoughts about that that we're going to get to in just a second. But I want to start by talking about the idea of are RTS games like that what people want? Is that what people are actually finding to be worth making these days? And it's definitely fair to say that we haven't really had, for a while at least, we haven't really had a like core RTS that's really like at the very least that's really made waves anywhere. Um, that's really struck out in the way that or stuck out in the way that like StarCraft II did, for example. Um, there is one that I will definitely call attention to that's being made by a bunch of like friends and former colleagues of mine over at Frost Giant Studios. It's a game called Stormgate that's being worked on. Um, I had the opportunity to play the demo for it a little bit during the Steam uh, Next Fest or whatever it was they had a few weeks ago. Um, and if you if you want StarCraft 3, you should definitely be paying very close attention to Stormgate because it really feels like in every single way a spiritual successor to StarCraft 2. So Highly recommend if that's the style of RTS gameplay that you're looking for, keep a very, very close eye on Stormgate because that game, and it's being made by a bunch of the people who used to work on StarCraft, I should I should note. Highly recommend you keep a very close eye on Stormgate and what Frost Giant is up to over there because it's, it's looking to be very much a game in that vein. Um, it's worth noting, however, that there's been a lot of sort of uh, advancements and pivots and different types of RTS that have come out in the recent years. Like I would actually put games like Against the Storm or even Frostpunk and the upcoming Frostpunk 2. They, I wouldn't really call them an RTS necessarily, but they've taken a lot of ideas from the way that RTS is played and built kind of a new game with it or taken some of the core concepts from an RTS and expanded it in a different direction. Kind of like how uh, so many like roguelikes, for example, have taken the idea of uh, like, OK, well, it's a platformer, but it's a platformer that you run multiple times, for example, or uh, it's a top down adventure game, but it's a top down adventure game that you, you do this thing differently in it and so on. So uh, games like Against the Storm and Frostpunk are certainly ones that come to mind that, at least for me, scratch some of the same portion of my brain that RTS games do. Again, I wouldn't really call them an RTS but they, they have a lot of similarities to it. And if you're an RTS gamer and you haven't checked out those games, I do highly recommend it. Um, other interesting news on that note actually just came out uh, either yesterday or earlier today. I actually just saw it earlier today, so the timing has worked out pretty well in this. Um, but there is a studio called Uncapped Games that is sort of teasing. They haven't announced it yet. They will be announcing at uh, Summer Games Fest, which is coming up in June. Uh, but they're talking about a new RTS that's being helmed by David Kim, who, if you're not, if you haven't heard of David Kim, uh, he was he was the multiplayer lead on StarCraft II, and he's been heavily involved in the StarCraft uh, development and StarCraft community for a long time. Um, and they're working on a game, and the way David Kim talks about it, it sounds like they're kind of trying to make the next evolution of RTS, like an RTS that still plays like an RTS, still exists in the RTS space, still works like an RTS, but is maybe less focused on, uh, in fact, the, the quote that David used in the, the article that I was reading on PC Gamer about it uh, is actually perfect. He was like, we want an RTS that isn't about playing the piano really fast. And he's referring to the way that like StarCraft II, for example, your APM became a huge deal and it became less about real-time strategy and more about real-time commanding each individual unit to do every single thing by themselves and like actually just trying to play 4,000 units all at once uh, on a screen, not 4,000, more like 30 or 40, but you, you get what I mean. Um, so it became less about real time strategy and the actual focus on strategy almost started to fall off and take back seat a little bit in some of these like big Starcraft engagements compared to your micro and your ability to individually control each individual unit, which feels more like just trying to control those units directly and less about strategy. And I totally get where that's coming from. 
Obviously, if you're someone who really, really loved StarCraft II, there's a good chance that that APM and that micromanagement and watching someone really control their unit, especially if you're a big fan of the esports like I was, uh, really watching someone individually controlling all those units and doing crazy things with their armies and splitting things off and so on, uh, targeting down individual units and so on, uh, That's that can be really, really fun. So if that's the sort of gameplay you're looking for, it kind of sounds like that's what David Kim's new project is moving away from. Maybe something like Stormgate might be more up your alley in that in that case. But it definitely sounds at the very least like if you are an RTS fan, there are some cool things either already out there or coming on the way. So I would definitely keep an eye out for all of that. I don't think it's the case that the industry as a whole has decided that RTS isn't worth going after. Um, if anything, I think I think that for a long time, the industry was like, well, StarCraft 2 exists and we can't really compete with that. So why are we going to make an RTS that tries to compete with StarCraft 2? Uh, it, it definitely is a smaller slice of the overall player base that's interested in RTS as well, I should say. So it's not like there's millions and millions and millions of RTS gamers out there. Um, so when there's something like StarCraft 2 that's so prominent, it makes sense for studios to want to back away from that a little bit and focus their attentions on other concepts and other ideas until something like StarCraft 2 starts to fall off, which it's it's now fallen out of public, uh, public eye pretty dramatically, I would say. StarCraft 2 has over the last few years, especially. So... Uh, it makes sense for those studios to have backed away from it for a bit, but we're now reaching the point where not only has StarCraft II no longer been feeling like a major competitor for a new RTS that's trying to come out, but also there's been time for those new RTSs to have some development put towards them. So we're starting to see the post-StarCraft uh, sort of concepts starting to come to light these days, which is where we get things like Stormgate. Um, it's where we start to see those concepts that have branched in different directions, like Against the Storm or Frostpunk. Again, I don't, I, I wouldn't really call those RTS, but I, I just want to be clear about that. So no one's coming at me and being like, I can't believe he called Against the Storm an RTS. Like, no, it's not. It's definitely a different game, but it scratches a lot of the same sort of sensibilities. And I would not be surprised if the developers of Against the Storm were StarCraft fans, or at least some of them were people that played RTS. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent now. Um, regardless... It does seem like there are some interesting things on the way that it's definitely worth keeping an eye out for. I think we're reaching that point where those concepts are going to start to come to light. As for the question of StarCraft 3 itself and the actual concept of a new StarCraft game, um, I think it would be very dumb of Blizzard to not do something new in the StarCraft, like with the StarCraft IP. Um, and it is definitely, it's about time for that. Like, um, if you remember StarCraft 2, like a whole big tagline for StarCraft 2 was, hell, it's about time. That game came out 12 years after uh, StarCraft 1 did, uh, but it was released in 2010. It's been 14 years since StarCraft 2, well, just shy of 14 years since StarCraft 2 came out. Um, it's it's about time again, I would say. Um, so hopefully somebody somewhere at Blizzard is planning out some sort of new game doing something with the StarCraft I IP. Um, I don't know that it would be a new RTS. I don't I don't know that they would be directly working on a new StarCraft game in that typical sense. Uh, it feels to me like the sort of thing that Blizzard would want to play around in that uh, that story, play around in that that world a little bit um, and try to come up with something different to do. Who knows? Maybe they'll they'll revive StarCraft Ghost or something like that. They'll go back to earlier concepts of different types of games that could come along. Um, I think it's inevitable that we see something related to StarCraft again in the future because it's a really powerful IP and it would be dumb for Blizzard and for Microsoft now to just sit on that and never do anything with it. Um, it's not like, you know, the the rock and roll racings and the, uh, the, the Lost Vikings of the universe where like, yeah, those were fun games, but they weren't really like household names the way that things like StarCraft are. So I absolutely think we'll see new StarCraft stuff at some point. I just don't know when that point will be, and I don't know for sure. Like, I, I would guess that it probably would not take the form of a brand new RTS, but I could be wrong on that. That's just me sort of going off of my hunch of how, like, Blizzard tends to operate about things and how I, I think, I, I, I genuinely think it would be smart for them to start to try to expand the StarCraft, like, lineup of products away from pure RTS a little bit. Um, but that also could just be, be like, selfishly a little bit because um, I know a bunch of the people that are working on uh, Stormgate, uh, and obviously there's a bunch of people that are now working on this this unannounced project that David Kim is working on as well. I want to see those do well, so I, I actually, part of me just kind of hopes that Blizzard isn't working on a StarCraft 3 right now, because I don't want, like, Stormgate to come out, and then immediately Blizzard is like, and StarCraft 3, and it's like, well, crap, that took the wind out of Stormgate sales. I really want to see Stormgate do well. Um, so, 
that was very rambly. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, I definitely think that RTS games like that can still be uh, something that's that's popular. Um, I just think the there needs to be a little bit of an evolution of it. And I think if you're really trying to grasp a wider player base, um, in fact, actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to continue on this topic real quick for a second, because I think it's worth pointing out for StarCraft as well. Um, I know a ton of StarCraft fans who do not play uh, and some who don't even own StarCraft. And that's because StarCraft was the sort of game that I think really took off as an eSport because a lot of people recognize this is very hard and like playing at the level of these players is incredibly difficult. And so they look at that and say, I'm never like, I'm never going to be good as, as Faker, for example. I'm never going to be as good as Huck or somebody like that. Um, and you're, you're, you're watching these guys play and you're like, yeah, that's just never going to happen. I'm never going to be as good at that as that player. And I don't want to go on the ladder and face off against players like this. Obviously, there's still the single player aspect of the game that I know a lot of people really enjoy the story of. But I find RTS to be a little bit weird as a storytelling mechanic in this day and age, at the very least. Um, regardless, uh, I, I definitely think there were a lot of people who were fans of StarCraft, but didn't necessarily want to play it and would be less inclined to purchase a new RTS having been exposed to that and going, yeah, the gameplay is not for me. I'll totally watch someone play it, but the gameplay itself is not for me. Um, so I think it's important that RTS continues to innovate a little bit and continues to iterate and come up with these new ideas. And so the stuff that David Kim was talking about uh, in the game that he's working on, the unannounced game that Uncapped Games is working on, uh, that's really exciting to me because that's the concept of let's figure out a way to make RTS more about the strategy and the overall thinking and Things like deciding when to expand and deciding what units to produce and less about individually micromanaging each individual unit so that it's more palatable to people like me who are not very good at playing the piano really fast. That's that's kind of my overall take on that at this point. I really do hope that we continue to see that happening. Um, and I, I again, I think a, another StarCraft product at some point is inevitable. It'd be very dumb for Blizzard or excuse me, for Microsoft to purchase Blizzard and then not do something with the StarCraft IP. That would be very dumb. Cool. Let's move on. Next question came from Bloodhaven, also on Patreon, who says, uh, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Warband system in WoW? So first of all, I appreciate the WoW sort of leaning into the World of Warcraft War Within meme a little bit. Uh, I just find that funny and I see what you did there. Um, as to the Warband system itself, I talked a little bit about this in the Sounds Good Make, epi Make Sense episode last week. Um, where I really hope to see this be something that gets expanded a little bit further um, and maybe eventually could be something that leans into player housing in some sort of concept where maybe you have like a war camp that you actually go to and you're able to walk around as one of your characters and see your other characters like sitting there and doing things, maybe even assign them to do tasks or something. I don't know, put a mission table in there. I never thought I would actually ask for a mission table, but that seems like the sort of thing that could be cool to be like, yeah, you have this character, send them off to do something while you're playing the other character. I don't know, just a general idea. Regardless of how probably terrible that idea is, um, the concept of the Warband system, and especially now that I've had a chance to play with it a little bit in the War Within Alpha, because I did get access. Thank you so much, Blizzard. Um, I got a chance to play with it a little bit. And what's interesting is the extent that I'm finding to which they're really embracing the Warband system. Like, uh, the thing that I noticed that it actually took me a minute to realize what was going on, when I started playing a second character in the War Within Alpha, all of the quests that I was coming up to were like the the icons were like grayed out as I got to them. I was like, that's that's a little bit weird. And for what it's worth, I do think that the graphic, like the actual user interface, the way that it looks needs a little bit of work because it it just struck me as very weird at first. Um, but I noticed as I was clicking on these quests that it said uh, a member of your war band has already completed this quest, which means that more than likely this is just the game saying you've already done this. You've already got credit for this. You don't like you can do this again if you want for this character, but you don't need to. Um, and that to me shows like that's the sort of thing that shows this real like hard philosophical shift towards the concept. Like they're not just saying, oh, yeah, we have war bands and everything that we make account wide kind of fits into war bands. It really seems like they're they're fully dedicating towards the concept of everything is account wide. Everything is tied to your war band. And the few exceptions to that are exceptions, not the rule, uh, which is a very, very big philosophical shift for, for World of Warcraft as a video game and a very big technical shift for the game as well. 
Um, so that that actually was really cool to see because I, I love the concept of like, yeah, my next character, I don't have to worry about going and unlocking this thing at all. I don't have to worry about whether or not they bothered to make this thing account wide because everything is account wide by default. And the only exceptions, like I said, are things that they specifically have went in and removed the account wide status on for whatever reason. Um, and thus far, I actually don't know if any of those things even exist. It's possible that everything is account wide and they just leave it that way. Um, I think I would expect that at some point there would be something that they decide, you yeah, know, every character needs to do this. Um, but that could be as simple as things like, you know, uh, you picked a profession and because you you decided to go blacksmithing on the first character and then you went jewel crafting on the second character. Yes, you do need to do the jewel crafting quest still on your next character. It's not necessarily the same quest overall. And you, you do need to do this other content that unlocks these different professions. But even then, who knows, maybe that would be something that once you've done the jewel crafting quest, if you then have another character that is also a jewel crafter, it's already done for you. Um, I don't know. Uh, that there's there's definitely some some things that I'll be looking to learn more about the warband system as they continue to open up more of the war within alpha and they continue to expand on what's available in there. There's not a ton available for actual play in the war within alpha right now. There's basically one zone, uh, two dungeons and three or four dwell four delves. I think it's three delves. I don't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, but regardless, the warband system is definitely looking to be the almost bigger of a philosophical shift than I think Blizzard is even really expanding on themselves. Uh, it really seems like a, from the core, they're now saying, yes, everything is account wide by default. Uh, and then theoretically from there, they could make things that were not account wide if they specifically wanted to exclude things from that. But that's important as a philosophical shift because the act of excluding something from an existing rule set is different than trying to add a rule set to everything that is created. It just means by default, things are account wide, and that's good to me. Um, that that I really appreciate. I've I've talked about this a little bit in the sounds good makes sense episode as well, but I really appreciate the concept of everything being account wide by default because it really does come down to the kind like I've done it as a player. I don't necessarily need to do this unlock. I don't need to see this story again unless I want to. Like I don't need to do this unlock again unless I want to. I don't need to go through this again because I've already experienced that. I have the memory of this. Going and doing it a second time feels like a chore to do before I can get to the point of the game that I want to actually be participating in, as opposed to actual gameplay and actual content. So I do really enjoy that. Um, I'm very excited to see how the Warband system continues to expand out a little bit. Um, obviously, there's things like the Warband Bank. There's things like Warband Gold. Um, personally, I would really like to see, I don't know, it's possible that this already exists this way. But I would really like to see Warband Gold, for example, be something that all of your characters can use. So, like, just without having to go to a thing and withdraw Warband Gold. Like, if I want to go repair my gear, or if I want to go buy something off the auction house, I don't want to have to go to the Warband Bank, withdraw gold, then go to the auction house and spend that gold. It'd be great if I could just spend that Warband Gold right from there. Almost, like, I know, I know there's probably people that would prefer to have each individual character have their own set of gold. Me personally, I would like to be able to put all of my gold from my entire account into one big pool and be able to use that as though I was just spending gold on any of my characters. Um, but we'll see. Like I said, I can see reasons why, why maybe someone wouldn't want to wouldn't want that to be the default at the very least. Regardless, um, I'm very, very optimistic toward the Warband system. I also, for what it's worth, I like how the character creation screen or the character select screen is shaping up. It's a little bit janky in the War Within Alpha right now because it kind of shows the old one and then transitions to the new one, but I'm sure that'll get fixed at some point. Um, I, it just is a cool system, and I'm looking to see how they continue to expand on it. Um, I, I really do really do like the direction that they're going with it. All right, let's move on. Next question comes from YouTube uh, from, uh, I'm going to say Daria's Raven. I am assume that's how it's pronounced. Uh, I have to be missing something about the hero talents. All the ones I've seen on Wowhead just look like another chunk of talents. None look that interesting, and you get all or most of them by the time you're leveled. So aren't they just another chunk of talents? Am I missing something because it doesn't seem like a big thing? So at the core here, honestly, you're not wrong. Like, it is just another chunk of talents. Um, what I think is important about this is reasons why it just being another chunk of talents is actually good. Um, and why uh, the, the couple of choices that are actually made in there. So essentially, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar yet, the way that hero talents work, every spec gets the choice between two hero talent trees. 
Um, and yes, you will unlock every talent in that tree by the time you're fully leveled. There are a couple of choice nodes in there where you have to pick one or the other, um, but you will have the entire tree unlocked no matter what. Like there, there is no option to spend those points elsewhere. There is no option to mix and match between the different trees. If you choose to be a scale commander, uh, destruction evoker or devastation evoker, for example, then you will get all of these scale commander points uh, as you have finished leveling by the time you're by the time you're max level. And that that's I think that's important because they were not trying to add additional complexity to the game, or at least not that much additional complexity to the game by doing this. I think their goals here were um, the, add some extra flavor to each of the classes. They stated before that their goal was what you are, but more. So it's more about leaning into an aspect of the class that you're playing or the spec that you're playing that you like or providing some additional flavor or an additional layer of something to your spec that you're playing without taking it over, without making it a fully different thing. Like if you become a Shadow Pan Monk, for example, the Shadow Pan Monk uh, as a Windwalker, which is what I've been playing mostly primarily in the War with an Alpha so far. Uh, the Shadow Pan Monk just basically is, uh, it's it's some bonuses to your Windwalker stuff. It makes your Blackout kit cooler. It adds this flurry stuff. It makes your Fist of Fury a bit cooler. And it just basically adds some extra damage on top of it in a couple of interesting ways. It's not just straight up increased damage by X percent, uh, but it does add a few new things for you to sort of play with. But it doesn't add any buttons and it doesn't change how your abilities work. It doesn't like completely redefine anything. It just kind of says, hey, you like kicking things, you like punching things. Here's the punch and kick things tree that adds a few more benefits for when you're punching and kicking things. And that I appreciate. That's one thing that I really like about that tree is it gives a great option, especially for Windwalker, which at least in Dragonflight right now, I think is a very, very over bloated and kind of, uh, there's just too much going on for Windwalker right now. It's honestly part of why I've had trouble getting back into Dragonflight. I've mostly talked about like the the quests and everything being overwhelming, but also trying to trying to play a Windwalker right now is also a little bit overwhelming. As a returning player, um, as a, as an aside as well, a lot of the Windwalker changes they've slimmed down some of the button bloat. You still have a ton of buttons as a Windwalker, but I'm not like scrambling for action bar space trying to figure out where to put Feline Stomp and stuff like that um, because it's an option. I can just choose not to have it, and it's perfectly fine. And there's just generally fewer buttons in general. But that's more of an aside about how Windwalker Monk is playing on the War with an Alpha right now. Um, let's get back to the concept of the hero talents. As this Windwalker. And especially coming off of Dragonflight, I was very happy to see a tree that was not like, we're going to completely change how your spec plays. It's like, no, this is this is leaning into the part of Windwalker that I like. It's is making my normal Windwalker play just a little bit better in some cool and different ways, giving me a couple of different choices on how to go about that, but nothing that's so incredibly substantial that I feel like if I make a wrong choice between the choice nodes or if I don't take this tree and instead take the other one, that I've made a catastrophically bad choice. Now, I do expect that with all these hero talents, there will eventually be a meta that forms a little bit. And there, as people start to figure them out, it'll eventually be the case where it's like, oh, you went that tree instead of that tree. That is incorrect. You should go the other one because it's more damage or you should go the other one because the healing is better. It's more effective in some way or another. I absolutely expect that that will end up being the case. I think in a game like World of Warcraft, that's pretty much inevitable. People are going to min-max things down to fractions of a percent. Uh, and that will just always be the case. As long as the remains as fractions of percent, it's still okay because then you can still choose the other one and know that unless you're like a world first raider, you're like really, really pushing bleeding edge progression, uh, that is probably, it's probably fine. And it's whatever you're more comfortable with and whatever you personally are going to play better is the, the correct choice in that case. And it's less about whether or not one does 0.05% more damage than the other one. Again, as long as the overall difference is kept relatively similar, which is actually a huge, <laughs> that's very difficult for them to do balance wise. So we'll see how that works out in total. But I think the fact that this isn't, in most cases, adding too much to the overall gameplay is actually an important part of why hero talents can work. Because again, they're just adding an extra layer to something that you're already doing. They're not redefining your play style. Um, and the couple of trees that I played around with, I've talked a bit about the Shadow Pan Monk so far, um, but I was also playing around with the Scale Commander Evoker a fair bit, and I don't really know how to play it Evoker. I literally had to get in a Discord call uh, with with a couple of the people, in fact, from with Bloodhaven, who was one of the people who asked the uh, the earlier question about um, about the Warband system. 
uh, just to even understand how to play the spec because I, I hadn't really played it before. And I was like, okay, I see these buttons, but I, I don't, it wasn't like coming together for me in my head. So I had to get that explained to me a little bit. But once I had that understood, once I recognized where I was going with it, and I started playing around with the scale commander. Um, it's super cool just from a flavor perspective. I expect it'll also be effective because it does provide a lot of group-based benefits like the bombardment and so on. Um, but it's just kind of cool to be there like attacking things and going through like using your disintegration beams and splitting that among multiple targets in some cases. Um, and then just seeing these like other like evokers flying by overhead. Uh, these are the drag here flying by overhead. They, they just come screaming past. The sound effects are great. They drop a bomb and they just go by. And it's not like a constant thing. It's just kind of cool. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am a little bit worried that in like a big group setting, like I could see in a raid, these like if you have three of these in your raid and there's just these scale commanders like screaming by constantly, I could see that being annoying. Hopefully there's some hopefully Blizzard's got that on their radar to be able to dial that back a little bit. But that's a case where genuinely it's the feel of it that makes me enjoy that a lot. Um, the gameplay of it is also good. Don't get me wrong. But the that feeling of, yeah, I am I'm doing this stuff and it's commanding these extra drag theater to come flying by and add to my damage. Uh, and it could, because I've commanded them to do so, that just felt pretty cool. And the the way that the effects work together kind of helps sell that fantasy a lot. So um, I wouldn't expect Hero Talents to be something that redefines how your class is played. I wouldn't expect this to be the sort of thing that's like, oh my god, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pick this, and now my now my paladin is actually just I don't know my paladin is just is Tyrion Fordring. I am Tyrion Fordring now. It's maybe a bad example because Tyrion Fordring is basically just a basic paladin, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I don't think I don't think it's going to be that sort of like class redefining or experience redefining thing, and I think that's good. I think it's important that this system is not something that takes your class and turns it into something else entirely uh, for two reasons. One, I don't think that's necessary. I think people pick their class and they don't necessarily want to then be forced later into picking something else that's going to redefine. Like if I if I'm leveling my character and I want to play a retribution paladin, I don't want to get to uh, the new expansion. I don't want to get into the war within and suddenly it's like, OK, retribution paladin, your options are Shockadin or Holy Pally. And it's like, well, no, but I picked Ret. I want to be Ret. Let me be ret. Like I think, I think it's important that it sticks to the fantasy at its core, at the very least, of what you were already doing, and just feels like an extension of that. Uh, the second reason I think it's important is because I'm really hoping that Hero Talents turns out to be a system that they can continue to add things to in future expansions. So, like, say Midnight comes along, maybe they could add a third option for each class or each tree. They could add like, okay, now it's. Uh, your choices are Celestial Monk or Shadow Pan Monk, but now there's a third option that's like, I don't know, uh, Smoke Mysticism Monk or something like that. Now you have a third choice that you can make as a Windwalker. It will be easier for them to continue to add options to this system going forward in the future if these options aren't game redefining and just completely redeveloping the way that your class works every single time. So... Um, I don't think you're wrong that they are just basically another chunk of talents. In fact, they, you don't even really make that much in the way of choices. Like I said, there's a couple of choice nodes, but you will get all of these unlocked in the tree. The choices are really which of these two uh, trees do you want? And then the three or four different choice nodes inside of it picking between them. And most of the time, those are just kind of doing the same thing in two different ways, regardless. Um, it's not a ton of player choice. It's not a ton of player agency, but it is some. And it does allow you, at the very least, to pick between what aspect of your class, like uh, Windwalker, again, using Windwalker as an example, because that's what I've, I've spent the most time on. There's the Shadow Pan Monk option that I went for, which, again, is like mostly leaning into punching and kicking and, and beating things up. But the other option that's available really leans into the Celestial side of things and how you like you summon New Zhao, you summon uh, Chi-Gi, and so on. You have all these different uh, Celestials that you can get help from and assistance from. And so if as you're playing, as you are playing your monk, you more feel like you want to play on that more mystic celestial side of the, the fantasy than you do the punching and kicking side of the fantasy, uh, then that option is there for you. And you, you can lean into that because you've decided that that's the aspect of monk that you're more interested in. Me, I'm real basic. I just like to punch and kick things. Um, <laughs> but hopefully that, that answers that question a fair bit. Um, it's definitely the sort of thing where I, I expect a lot of people are going to have that same sort of reaction of 
this just kind of looks like some new stuff. It, sure, it's just some extra stuff. It's just there. Um, but I think it's a more interesting option than something even more basic, for example. Like, they could have just done, like, what they've done in previous expansions way back in the classic days, which is just, welcome to the new expansion. Here's your new two abilities. There you are. Th those are them. This at least is giving you some choice between what those are um, and allowing you to sort of direct the flow of your character a little bit. So... I'm still optimistic for it. I think I think they're fun. The the couple of trees that I've played around with so far, I've enjoyed. So hopefully, um, as they continue to iterate on the uh, on the alpha and into the beta, um, which it's good that they have all these trees playable this early, so they have time to do that. Hopefully, that will really start to solidify into something where it's a little bit clearer exactly what the benefit of these are. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for watching. Again, if you'd like to ask a question. You can just leave a comment below here on YouTube or head over to Patreon. That's patreon.com slash devilor. Um, and over there, you will be able to, if you are a, patrons, a Patreon subscriber, you'll be able to find a link in the uh, description for this video when it's posted over there to submit your form or uh, to a form that will let you submit your question directly so that you get that advantage of having first crack at your questions being answered here on the show. All right, I'm out of here. Thanks again, everybody. I'll see you next time.